lo and behold, Senator Tarr has now referred that matter to the federal uh, folks, uh, Treasury Department, for an opinion as to whether or not West Virginia is going to be subject to a clawback of some of that federal money, those ARPA funds that were uh, uh, ended up in the governor's discretionary account. So Senator Tarr is certainly uh, gunning for the, uh, the governor here on this, and, and uh, so I, I, I guess there's some legitimacy beyond the uh, the tax issue here to the, at least the Senate's concern about how the governor spent this money. And I say all that because I'm wondering with that and the other issues that seem to be bubbling up regarding the executive branch of our government, whether this is going to affect Jim Justice's decision to run for Senate, and if he runs, if this is going to be such a serious campaign issue that his campaign will suffer. And I'm talking about not only the Marshall Baseball field, but the state police scandals uh, that are many <laughs> and apparently very serious and involving now in investigations by the Department of Justice and the FBI. I'm talking about a recent lawsuit that has been filed by Stephen New, who's an attorney in the southern part of the state, claiming that jail inmates were forced to sign statements indicating that conditions in the jails were, were really pretty good when they're not. And, uh, and of course, we know the governor was, continues to have uh, issues regarding his businesses and taxes. Uh, I'm just wondering if all of this is going to be a big hill to climb for the governor if he chooses to run for Senate. All right, Mike Kite has his hand up first. We'll go to you, Michael. So I, I want to respond to this um, because we, we mentioned earlier the, the New York DA and, and his, um, his indictment of Trump or, or bringing charges against Trump as well. And what irritates me about a lot of these things is timing. And it seems like Senator Tarr waited, got what he wanted in the Senate, and now is bringing the charges when he had the opportunity he could have done this before but but it was the timing get what i want and now i'm going to bring the charges like he couldn't have brought the charges before same thing with the da in new york with the allegations against trump the the da before him had the opportunity to to bring these charges the department of uh, justice had the opportunity to bring these charges the DA in New York right now had the opportunity to bring these charges before and refused to do it. And now that he has announced that he's going to run for president, now the charges come out. And it seems like the same thing with with the justice issue. It's now. And when you do it in this fashion, whether there is guilt or innocence, it, there is a perception that this is now political and not about the facts of the case and that's what concerns me when these things happen alonzo uh, i'm gonna actually i'm gonna disagree and so first there's there's a lot to unpack here we have you know the investigation as you said um he's running for senate and you're wondering if you know the state police issue and um i guess buying the stadium for marshall is going to cause anything to inhibit that first i want to say no i don't think that that's going to have any uh, direct impact on his Senate campaign whatsoever. Uh, I think that with a lot of these investigations and a lot of the times where people are accused of um, these types of you know issues of corruption, uh, for some reason it it doesn't reach the voter at you know the West Virginia like the state level. Now, um, as for if this was an appropriate time for uh, Senator Tarr to actually bring this accusation. I think that this is the most appropriate time, you know, to to gridlock the session and create, you know, a period uh, of dismay and, and kind of bad blood while the session's going on, I think is just, you know, it, it causes us to be ineffective in getting legislation passed and moving the state forward. And it's almost di as a distraction. He, Governor Justice should know that this was going to um, come out at some point and that this was going to be pursued. Tar had already rung the bell on it when proposing the budget, but bringing it up now, I think, is far more appropriate than saying, you know, um, let's let's stop everything in this session. Let's create more tension and um, not do the things that we know um, 
West Virginians want us to do in a small quarter, you know, of a year session. Mike Hornby. So I think uh, I think Senator Tarr referred it to the Fed, feds, but to 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 kind of push back what Alonzo said a little bit. If you think Alex Mooney is not going to take advantage of this and let every single West Virginia know exactly every bad thing that 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 Governor Justice has done, you, you obviously haven't been paying attention to Alex Mooney and how he campaigns. Uh, the man campaigns better than anybody I've ever seen, and he will go for the jugular. So to answer Joe's question, I do think this could affect if Jim Justice runs, when he runs. Um, I do think this could be a major issue, and if this is just the tip of the iceberg, if you will, um, then it could have profound impact. Uh, I do think Justice is very popular amongst uh, West Virginians, but if Alex plays his cards right, this could be a large impact on, on that race and you know, knowing Alex Mooney I think he's going to go for the juggler and he's, he's going to make this a, a really competitive race. Larry Schultz? Yeah, let me first say that um, somewhere Jim Jordan is weeping about this weaponization of the federal government um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, you I'm heartbroken to get that yeah. dripping off your beard I, right I there? too am heartbroken <laughs> yeah. um, look there's a simple way to avoid the timing, the bad timing of a prosecution. Don't commit the damn crime. And if well, they are innocent here, until proven guilty, right. I think I mean, you are a lawyer. You tell right. me is that that's the way that goes, right? Right. But if okay. there is a crime, then you go by the statute of limitations. And something tells me that these kind of corruption crimes have a very long statute of limitations. That's the test of whether it's too late or not. Not what some politician from Ohio thinks, uh, Jim Jordan, and not what we think here. It's the statute of limitations for the crime. There's no secondary rule that says, well, if you could have brought it earlier, but you didn't, then uh, you're out of luck. I don't disagree with you, but I'm saying the timing is what makes it political. You could have brought it. You could have brought it. You you have a statute of limitations, and you waited until the opportune political time to bring the charges because now it's in the headlines, and he'll be tried in the media. Whether so he's are we talking about but, Trump or are we talking about justice? I'm talking about where, where are we going with we're, this? Because we're I hope about we're talking about both. justice for yeah. Trump. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> he'll get no justice in the court. <laughs> Two but, totally but different the, cases. My my question or my my comment here is to point out that you don't get to say, well, it was politicized. That jury will be sequestered. That jury will have an opportunity to consider the facts. And that jury will make its decision. He may get a gr- get lucky and draw a group of justice voters, and they might, uh, in determining this case, say, "No, we're gonna we're gonna kind of ignore the actual facts, and we won't find him guilty." It happens. So both sides take a risk when you wait a while, <laughs> when you don't jump on it at the first moment. But that risk is equally. Uh, shared it's equally fair but don't um, you think it's political when you do it when you know there's an election coming up he's going to be have to be campaigning and you're giving the opposite side ammunition guilty or innocent in the court of public opinion he's being tried in the media and that affects how people vote which is what makes all of this political in the timing well the problem is that you have a choice when you're a politician Knowing that you're going to have future elections that you want to run in, you may want to lay off committing felony crimes. <laughs> Once again, so, he's innocent until proven guilty. I'm right? not saying he's innocent. I'm not saying he's guilty. I'm saying the timing of this, they could have brought these charges. They've known about this for some time. These charges could have been brought way so before now. Who else besides politicians will get this special treatment under our laws? Business people? Uh, people with disabilities, who's going to, how are we going to parse out this thing? Or is it only for politicians? I mean, there are lots of political, uh, political cases that are not brought against politicians. A lot of very big cases, uh, might have to do with some issue, 
uh, in uh, in criminal cases, some issue that arises in the case that could have been changed by the state legislature and hadn't been. So now we got to go all the way around the barn uh, to to convict this guy of of something that he did. I, I'm just saying that the test here is not whether we think it's political, and especially when the people bringing the claim are of the same party as the governor. I just don't think that the political thing plays that much into it. Can we? But I don't think, you know, we've, we haven't really established that he's done anything wrong yet, right? It's just a referral to the feds. The, sure. The, the questions out there that people have questioned, but we don't know that anything untoward has, has happened. And, and I don't think him waiting a month is, is Tar waiting a month is that political? I, I really don't. I think he just waited to after the session. Well, it's to get been it done. A, it's been more than a month because right. we knew about this before the session. Yeah. Alonzo, uh, well, one, let's just you know uh, bring us back to the issue at hand. Right. I mean, the guy bought a stadium. I don't think you know attacking a guy for you know trying to help a university. Uh, I don't even think that that's a, a smart way to deal with the thing. You know, uh, Jim Justice has. A, a, a long record of things that he could be attacked on. I think trying to attack him on this issue in particular would backfire tremendously. I think that, you know, um, it, it's a positive, feel good kind of buy. Now, I would say uh, some of your more hardline conservatives are going to be completely upset that he went and spent, you know, uh, federal money that we received or, or any of our money just to buy, you know, a project like this. But I just don't believe the types of people that go out to vote for Jim Justice will say this is, you know, something that is I'm totally against. Can't believe he did that and walk away, you know, from the polls saying I didn't vote for Jim Justice. It's just not going to happen. So uh, and as for if this is a, an appropriate time, I think that this is uh the best possible time to bring this issue up. It's it's not a political way to do it. It's a way that is effective in the sense of, hey, maybe we need to look at this, and it's not during a convoluted session where everyone's rushing to try to pass bills. Governor Justice did seek uh, legal counsel before he reappropriated the money. It's it's not something that he did without getting legal advice. And after this was examined by his legal counsel, and and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, isn't uh, was it was Berkeley Bentley part of that team? Do you know, Joe? Yes, yes, uh, and and the uh, law firm that uh, he's a member of has been counseling the governor on a number of issues, and also this um, uh, this company BDO, which uh, if you've seen their advertisements, they, they assist in, in managerial issues. Uh, they also weighed in on this issue with the governor's use of that money, so he does have cover there. I agree. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, on the flip side of this, uh, that was money that, if I remember some of the interviews we have done, was money that was previously set aside for the prison situation that we have in this day, which is so dire that I think the National Guard is pretty much running the prisons right now uh, because of the employee situation. So there there may be some concern about taking, I think it was up to $14 million away from that part of the funding to fix a major problem in our state and reappropriating it for a baseball stadium at Marshall. So that, I think, also has to be considered, although I'm not so sure how many people really know the nuances of how that money worked there, Joe. Uh, no, I, that's true. Uh, and that would foster some criticism if uh, that money was, was earmarked for something else that's uh, uh, in dire need here in West Virginia versus uh, a baseball field in Marshall where the governor went to school. Uh, the, the point is here, though, that, that these scandals seem to be all tied in with the executive branch of our state government. And to echo Mike Hornby, there's a certain congressman right now who is salivating at the chance of bringing these issues up, because up until this point, I thought the governor was going to be bulletproof if he chose to run for that Senate seat. Now I'm not so sure, because uh, this state police uh, problem and the allegations floating around about that, which includes hidden cameras in women's locker rooms at the uh, academy with the state police and destruction of evidence. Uh, and this is under the watch of, of somebody from Greenbrier County, who was a buddy of the governor's, who was running the state police at the time. Uh, I, I think there's potential here for blowback, which could really shape the race involving uh, the governor and Mooney if that race materializes. 
Were you surprised, Joe, after the legislation that was uh, passed on the tax cut bill went through pretty easily? Actually, were you surprised that Tar went ahead and brought this uh, forward? I, I, well, <laughs> knowing the bad blood between the two, I'm not surprised. I, I, I could tell you there's always danger in inviting the scrutiny of the federalities to look at you know, how state money has been handled. Uh, there's, uh, there's always danger with that. And uh, so you have to wonder where that might lead. And the other question is, okay, let's say that the feds come in and determine that the uh, money was misappropriated and, and not spent uh, in accordance with the uh, regulations regarding that ARPA money. Who pays to uh, reimburse the feds? Because that's what they're going to want to want. They're going to want that money back. Who's going to pay that money, and where's it coming from? We the people, do. People of West Virginia. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and and, and how is that going to play on the campaign trail? That's a tough one. I still think it's a long-winded flyer. I, I still think it's a long-winded flyer. All right. Joe, you, have you had the final word, Joe? Yeah. I, I just, again, I think that uh, uh, where I, was, I thought he was uh, invulnerable as a candidate going forward, he had a 68% favorability rating in this state the last time I saw. Uh, I'm not sure now that uh, there, there's going to be some some issues he's going to have to address on the campaign trail. And and Mike Hornby's right. Uh, Mooney is a master at bringing up those sorts of things in the campaign. So uh, could be a tough slog for the governor going forward. Thank you, Joe. Good issue number one. Mike Hornby, you're on the clock with issue number two after the commercial break here. And Mr. Hornby, you lead off hour number two. Yes, yeah, so um, obviously when I went down to the legislature, I really, I considered myself a far-right, super conservative Republican. That's kind of who I am, right? Uh, and then I got down there and realized that's not who I am at all. Um, and so my question is, with the super majority um, Republican in, in West Virginia, is the, are we, are we, in danger of going too far right um, as a supermajority, kind of like what the Democrats did. That's how this the, we, the, the whole thing got flipped to Republican was the Dems went way too far left and, the, and we forgot what the actual people wanted. So my question is, as a supermajority Republican Party, are we in danger of going too far to the right? Before we get into the discussion on this, just for clarification to set the context of yeah. this, you thought that you were a super conservative guy. What convinced you that you weren't once you got to Charleston? <laughs> um, my stance on vaccinations, uh, my stance on a lot of things are a, a lot more uh, moderate than 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 some of these. And what is your stance on vaccinations? And I think you're not talking about I'm not COVID. Talk, I'm, I'm not for the COVID. I'm not. You know, you're talking about measles, talking mumps, rubella, about, polio. Uh, polio, those, those kind of things. The, the, my stance is the school children should be taking that and that's it protects lives and um, it, it's just the way it is. And uh, I got attacked early. When, you know, I think it was the first Wednesday. You're um, against religious freedom because I'm, you I'm believe I'm against vaccine. freedom. I'm a socialist and it, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, I am for economic development in, in the state. I do believe um, you know, that the you voted for form energy. I, I sure did. And, and you were accused of being a uh, fascist for that. <laughs> yeah, backing Bill Gates and his pedophilia and, and things like that. And I just, I can't relate the two together. So you, you, there are things that I, you have to trust your executive branch some, and you have to trust the people that you hire. And he, Mitch Carmichael's done a darn good job, in my opinion, in, in the economic development and the amount of money that has come back into West Virginia the last two years has been absolutely amazing. All right, so the question is, is the Republican Party in danger of going too far to the right, much like the Democrats did in going too far to the left? So I'm going to start with a completely impartial, unbiased opinion. For that, I go to Larry Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, um... <laughs> I'll just ignore the wrong part of the assumption, and, and, which is that and we Mike, lost. Here's the keys when Larry's done, lock up for me, okay? <laughs> um, I'll just ignore the part of the question that says the Democrats went too far left. I was here the whole time. I never noticed that. But uh, Of course you wouldn't. Let's, let's just say this. Um, this isn't just West Virginia where this is going on. I think there's at least one Mike Hornby in every Republican-dominated state legislature in this country where you're, where you're being told stuff that you know isn't true, and because you refuse to believe it, you're some kind of a commie or a, a, pick the name. 
um, a groomer, God help us, uh, in some of these places. Uh, look, the, the there's always going to be a fight, uh, whether you're all one party or not. And so uh, when everybody in the whole legislature is Republican, it still won't be a series of 100 to 0 votes. It'll be a 54 to 46 vote on stuff that everybody thinks is a good idea because people are playing their advantages. If there is no disputing, and this is something that I noticed a while back, and I don't know how to frame it exactly, but if there is no dispute in a legislature, you think nothing gets done now because there's too much dispute? Wait till there's none. They won't do much of anything. Or what they do do will be so crazy that it has no connection whatsoever to the needs of the people who are paying the taxes. And so this is a natural uh, sort of thing. Um, and it's interesting to hear Mike say that he thought he was a, a really rock-hard conservative, and then he went down there and found out. Uh, but I do think there's a line along there where you cross out of being conservative and you cross into some land of illogic and disgust for facts that has nothing to do with being conservative and is more perhaps treatable uh, in a state hospital. Um, <laughs> luckily, you fixed that whole PEIA thing. So, right? so I, I, I did vote for <laughs> I did vote for Trump twice. I'll probably vote for him another time. So does that mean I go into hospital because of that? You no. <laughs> What's remarkable is that now there are people who think that's not going to be enough on your part to be a conservative. Um, and the word conservative, you know, small c conservative, certainly doesn't mean some of the loopy stuff that we've heard prattled on about regarding conservative things by the extreme sort of a uh, wing of the National Republican Party. I don't think Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Boebert are conservatives. They want change. <laughs> conservatives generally don't. They want to keep going with m some minor changes to fix some things so that we become uh, more stable. That's not what I'm hearing from that particular wing of the party, and I think that wing of the party is at least as big in the West Virginia legislature as it is in the United States Congress. All right, let's go to Alonzo Perry, president of the Berkeley County Republican Club. Well, I, I honestly want to talk about, you know, just the, the whole essence of that argument, right? I mean, what is far right today, you know? And uh, I, I'm kind of getting lost in, in what is far right because to some people I'm far right, to some people I'm not right enough. And it's just, you know, it's, it's getting convoluted and I want to clear the air, right? For since about 2016, right, what we saw was a giant explosion in conservatism, right? It was the gold, uh, Goldwater versus uh, Rockefeller kind of debate, right? We were trying to figure out what is the soul of our party? What are we going to do? Are we still going to just be gatekeepers of the status quo or are we going to, you know, are we right about all of the issues that are facing this country right now? Are we right about illegitimacy? Are we right about crime? Are we right about, you know, what is moral, right? And so what I think has happened is some people have picked up, you know, what the essence of what Trump ran on. And some people, you know, are just conservatives that say, hmm, this is a viable option because, you know, he, he understands a lot of the core tenets. But they're still not, they're, they're still risk adverse. They're still change adverse. And so, you know, anybody that's understands the message that, that Trump was carrying, you know, is being labeled as far right or radical or extreme or crazy. And I just think that that's fundamentally flawed. Um, you know, this is about, uh, do we have the right to our autonomy? Are we going to deconstruct the administrative state? Are we going to stop the barriers of people being able to, uh, you know, respond to forces against them and you know are we going to deal with the technocrats and elites that are telling us you know that they can manage society better than we can and better than the free market can do in its own uh essence right you say you say elites but you know trump is, is pretty elite in, in in the way the beauty about trump was he he responded to the regular person like me he the way he ran Besides the, the, the tweeting and all that other stuff, his policies were fantastic, right? But I think we've gone even further right 
Trump still spent as much money as everybody else. He still did all the government stuff. He wasn't trying to blow up the government and, and take down the Capitol. Do he didn't do any of that. Uh, we've kind of Larry dif- that. disagrees with you on January. He, well, the <laughs> and that's that's why I keep, One day I remind myself <laughs> I am conservative because I'm sitting next to Larry and I'm not going back to January 6th every time because it wasn't Trump that did that. It was the people following Trump that did that or, and that were on the crazy right. All right, Alonzo, are you uh, finished? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, Joe Ferretti. Well, I think part of the problem and that maybe Mike saw this, both Mikes saw this at their time in Charleston, was that the legislation that suddenly pops up for consideration and, and redlining and, 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 and typically then a vote on it at some point in the process, it's coming from these think tank groups like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Uh, it's remarkable. You guys know I split my time between West Virginia and Georgia. You know, the same legislation is being kicked around down here as it was in West Virginia regarding uh, gender dysphoria and whether or not to ban uh, these uh, hormone suppressant drugs and things like that. The same debates, the same legislation. And that's happening all over the country. This model legislation is being passed around by these groups. And what, from what I hear, a lot of cutting and pasting taking place in our legislature in West Virginia, sometimes adopting the uh, proposed legislation wholesale without much thought as to whether or not it's right for our state. And I fear that that is the easy road taken in the legislative process to get things passed and to appeal to a certain part of our, our, our public. Uh, I think that's where some of this is coming from. And, and I, I would just hope our legislators would, would take a step back and say, you know, when we see these proposals, is it right for my constituents? Is it right for my state? As opposed to, you know, what's being pushed nationally. And I think that's part of perhaps what you saw, Mike, down there was that, uh, you know, some of this stuff comes in and everybody just says, oh, that sounds good. This is going to play well. And they adopt it, not thinking about the ramifications of some of that legislation. Mike Heitz. So well, I, good. Sorry, I Joe. think that's one of the I think that I, I just going to say I think that's part of the problem. Mr. Height. So let me start by saying when I first met Mr. Hornby, <laughs> he was he was an immigrant who had moved to California and then to West Virginia and since we become friends, I have drug him kicking and screaming to the right. He was as liberal as they come when I first met him. And I have drug him across these, the line these over, lies, over lies, to Rob. the right. So for him to think that he was ultra conservative... I don't know where he got those indications because we, we both know he doesn't live in the land of reality. No, with not at all. He is he is finally right of center um, somewhere. I would consider him a, a conservative moderate. Um, well, I think that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. But going down there, he is right. There are some right, right, right people down there, and and I don't have a problem calling them wackos because they are just wackos and i to to his question are are we in danger of moving too far right i'm going to say no and this is why i think those wackos make up about 20 percent maybe 25 percent if you still looked at the votes when it was time when those wackos stood up and they spoke and said some of the things they said and called us communists and everything else when the vote was taken it was still a 70-30, a 75-25 vote with the Dems siding with us <laughs> half the time against these wackos. Of, of course, the Dems are going to uh, be against the wackos. But it, it, I would say that the majority of the Dems down there are moderates. Um, they're not real far. There's a couple of them that are real far right. But, left. Far left. Or, excuse me. Yeah, yeah far yeah. left. Damn. But for the vast majority of them, I think, are sort of their l- left of center not way left. So there was a lot of times they were voting with the more moderate conservatives um, to get legislation passed. So even though they were standing up and calling you socialist and fascist and, you know, 
they still weren't winning the battle. They were a, a small majority, and as long as the people of West Virginia keep voting in sensible conservatives is what I would like to call ourselves, um, I don't think there's a, a, at least in West Virginia, I don't think there's any danger of the Republican Party moving too far to the right. Final word goes to you, Mike. Yes, I was in the uh, local club recently, and I had a lot of people comment to me that we should just not take any federal money anymore. Just, you know, get rid of it. We, we What's the local club? So the local Republican Alonso's club. club. Well, and, club. And, and, and this was just one-on-one talking to people. They're like, we just don't need the, the federal money. And, and you, when you look at it, our, our budget is $4 billion, $4.8 billion in, in revenue. But we also get $9 billion from the federal government. So if you, if you want to take away $9 billion from the state of West Virginia, which funds – a lot of our, our, our folks. Yeah, what are you gonna, cutting? W- you're cutting a lot of social programs, a lot of things. It, the, the right thing to do is say, yeah, we don't want federal money. $9 billion, twice our budget. We're going to just get rid of it. It's unrealistic. So that's right, my final to call. Issue number three. For that, I go to Alonzo Perry. So I want to talk about um, something that happened on I-81 that's actually kind of troubling to me. So... Um, should West Virginia remove the FOIA exemption then in our law that deals with investigations of crimes by law enforcement for the use of internal purposes? So uh, if people aren't familiar, there was a guy that died named Edmund Exline uh, in a struggle with police. He was tased by state police and had died. And um, when Harold Mail went to file a Freedom of Information request, they were denied, and they cited a West Virginia law saying that they can't release that information due to, or they have the ability to withhold it. And Justice, uh, Governor Justice was talking about how troubling the video was, but people aren't able to see it. So my question to the panel is whether you believe that uh, that law should be just completely revoked in order for people to see actual um, issues with law enforcement, or, or should that v- video be released in general? I'm going to bookend this one with lawyers and the sandwich in the middle are the delegates. So, Larry, I'm going to start with you first as an attorney. Sure. Th- there should be no FOIA exemptions for state police misconduct or any other police misconduct or any government misconduct of any kind. Um, the whole idea of the Freedom of Information Act is that the solitary citizen who wants to know what his government is up to can find out. There's not that many things. Now, obviously, you you wouldn't be able to use the FOIA to get the investigative record uh, uh, in order to find out stuff that the police know that even the guy's defense lawyer doesn't know yet. Um, There will be some limits in there uh, that will protect investigations, But this idea, especially in the current climate with all these problems with the state police, that they're going to be able to just hide. Um, I would love to see what other states do with regard to this, but I can't imagine they have the kind of protection that says you can't get a simple FOIA request answered. Delegate Um, Mike Height. Um, I'm going to say that I'm going to agree with Larry to an extent. As long as that FOIA request does not come during an active investigation, there may be some things during an active investigation that you don't want the general public to know um, and because it could influence your jurors one way or the other. So after the, after the investigation's over, after the trial's over and so on and so forth, I, I think it should be open to anybody that wants to see any parts of it. Delegate Mike Hornby. Well, this is pretty simple for me. Um, I think the Freedom of Information Act should be able to be used on any cam footage from any um, source. I think it's really funny when a, a citizen or a small business asks for a, a Freedom of Information Act, they just tell you no. But when NBC gets behind it or Fox or, or CBS, it sure does come out pretty fast. And current investigations and law, that seems to go right out the window. We can look locally. Um, I have Freedom of Information Act at the Sheriff's Department a number of times in the last year and been denied. By who? Uh, by the sheriff? Not by the sheriff, but by the um, the, the county attorney. Um, and, and just told, you know, we don't release that information. It's it's not for the public. But when a incident happened locally recently, um, we seemed to get body cam footage pretty darn easily when um, when they were freedom of by larger companies that could 
provide lawyers to do it. So uh, in response to, to the question, I think all footage should be available. It, it belongs to the public and any and all footage, no matter when, if you have it, you should be, the public has a right to see it, especially when it comes to um, in body, Mr. body cam footage. Mr. Ferretti. Well, it, it, certainly there are competing interests here. And a FOIA request is made of a law enforcement agency during the pendency of an investigation. Uh, oftentimes, the law enforcement people will say, look, you know, we, we have confidential sources. And if we produce information, we're going to you know, be forced to disclose those. And that inhibits our ability to do our job. Uh, there's sources and methods that they use in investigating crime, and they don't want those disclosed. And, of course, you know, the mere mention of somebody in an in investigative file, you know, a third innocent third party who, who might just have been statementized, might be a witness or whatever, that has a certain stigma to it. Uh, so uh, there's protections there under the law that allow certain materials to be excluded or exempted from a FOIA request. But the footage, the tasing of this individual in public was a public act. Everybody, anybody passing by could have seen that. So to me, by definition, that is the type of information that should be subject to a FOIA request and should be disclosed. Anything else that the police have done, perhaps in furtherance of an investigation, but are done in a public way, again, should be uh, disclosed in a FOIA request. Uh, so th there has to be lines drawn here, uh, the interest of serving uh, the law enforcement, but also interest serving the public. If you have public officials who are accused of certain misdeeds, uh, you know, there's got to be an overriding public interest here to get information about that, because these are public servants who are perhaps uh, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, so there's a balancing test that takes place in these kind of requests. I hope it's not a blanket excuse for the law enforcement in, in West Virginia to not produce any information. There ha they should produce some. And, but the li where the line's drawn is always a matter of debate. Final word goes back to Alonzo. No, I think uh, I agree with everybody on the panel. It's, it's really, it was mind boggling to me that, you know, not even the footage was produced. I understand there's, you know, internal documents and um, some of the exterior items that are used for, um, you know, the lawmaking or, you know, the lawyer aspect of this. But I just, you know, it, I can't believe that, you know, you could submit a form like this, which is supposed to just provide transparency for the American people. And it's just com fundamentally denied by a standing law in West Virginia. All right. Larry Schultz, you're on the clock. We'll take our uh, half way through the nine o'clock hour break here. We move on to issue number four. And for that, we go to attorney at law, Lawrence Schultz. Larry, you're on the clock. Will an indictment of Trump actually help Donald J. Trump's chances in the 24 GOP primaries. We're hearing that said all the time. I just want everybody to weigh in on whether they think it's so. Simple, Simple question, right? All yeah. Right. Joe Ferretti, let's go to you first. Well, put me in the camp of uh, those who believe that an indictment is never a good thing. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I would say that with his base, it will fire them up, but those are the folks that are always going to be fired up anyhow. They're going to show up for him. They're going to vote for him. So I, I'm wondering how many Republicans truthfully are hoping he gets indicted, because I have to believe that people in the Ron DeSantis camp, Nikki Haley camp, and perhaps others who are going to run on the Republican side are secretly hoping that somebody will take this guy out. Uh, because I, to, to this point in time, there seems to be a reluctance, especially on Ron DeSantis' part, to, to, to go after Trump and, and uh, his many problems. So I, I, I have to believe that uh, there's a, a fairly large contingent of Republicans that are hoping that the criminal justice system or civil justice system will take them down uh, just to rid themselves of him. But uh, I, I think it'll be a wash, Larry. I think that uh, overall he'll keep his base fired up, but I don't think it's going to keep uh, 
you know, 55 percent of the American public who votes fired up. Uh, I, I don't think he's going to be the kind of candidate that's going to win the general election no matter what. And I think being indicted is only going to hurt him worse in that regard. DeSantis did take a little subtle shot there when he was asked about the Stormy Daniels uh, situation in which he replied, I don't have a lot of experience in paying off hush money to hookers or, or porn stars, whatever, <laughs> so I really can't come. I thought that was a very nice little snarky, snide little uh, jab there. So, Mike Cornby, go ahead. I couldn't disagree more with uh, with Joe. Uh, yes, if he, if he gets indicted, this is going to fire up the people even more. Uh, Donald Trump's going to be the Republican candidate. Whether he wins in the general, I don't know, but um, the man's bulletproof at this point he just he, bring it on he, all, all you're doing is spurring on the, 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 the not only his base but the, the moderates going why are we doing this after all this time it just makes no sense um so i think to answer larry i think it will increase his chances not only in the primary but also for the general you sounded like you were resigned to a fate as you said no i mean i mean he, i i I said I voted for Donald Trump twice. I said that, and I'm probably going to have to vote for him again, um, whether I like the tweeting or in, not. In the primary? In the primary. Right. I mean, look at the numbers. I mean, everybody else is like 4%, 5%. None of those other candidates matter. Um, they're not making any waves. Nobody's going against Trump. Nobody's got these stones to— It's, it's already to, decided, but when it gets to West Virginia anyway. Yeah. I mean, in a primary, we have no yeah. we have no say in a primary. And so, you know, it is what it is. Um Will I vote for Donald Trump again? Absolutely. Alonzo. I think that uh, this indictment is definitely helping Trump. I think that it's, it's you know, uh, people that have forgot about Trump or don't care about Trump. Let's just talk about your kind of like more moderate, independent people. You know, I think they're starting to, to like wake up and, and ask questions like, you know, why do they keep pursuing this guy? And everything keeps falling through. It's almost like, you know, they, they're... Uh, this is like almost criminal, you know? I, I've seen posts where people are, are questioning, you know, where Democrats are going with this, why MSNBC is lying every day to them. I mean, they're, they are so tired of seeing, you know, this, this old adage, and all we're seeing is in the headlines, Trump, 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 Trump. And people are like, am I living better right now than I was when Trump was our president. And I think that that gauge, as we keep going towards, you know, this primary election, it's pushing him back across the, the finish line. The media elected Trump in 2016, and the media is going to elect him in 2024. The Electoral College elected Trump in 2016. The guy has never won the popular that's, vote. That's but our you system. Don't, you don't have that's, to that's how, okay. that's, that's how we fine. elect president. But don't tell me who elects them. Okay, well, right. well, we go don't by the tell me the media system. did it. Oh, but, no, the media sure helps, Larry. Um, that's how we elect presidents. You know, I think Barack Obama is the one who elected Donald Trump. You know, he divided the country to start with. Mike Hite. So I'm going to agree with uh, Alonzo here. That, um, I, I think most republicans his base is always going to be there for him but there's a lot of people out there that are saying right now here we go again another another trial for trump and to my point earlier it's all about timing we we sat on this information we sat on this indictment until he decided to run for president and then we brought it out so people are uh, saying no. here we go no. Here we go. We're we're gonna we're gonna attack Trump again. We're gonna put him on trial, and and we're gonna take him. This is how we're gonna take him down. And most people are saying, well, this has been done several times before, and nothing's ever come out of it. So this is just a way to get at him one more time. And there, I think there's a lot of people out there that had Trump fatigue and weren't going to vote for Trump, and this could inspire them to vote for Trump just because they're pissed off because this is happening again. Well, and, and a lot of it also could be dependent on whether or not Joe Biden is a is a point or not. Joe Ferretti, you were active there for yeah, a moment. I, I, yeah, I, I want to I want to come back at Mike Hyde on this point about Please. timing because <laughs> uh, I'll tell you right now, you, you'll be arguing about timing when he gets indicted in Georgia too. But he is the one dictating the timing in many of these investigations. It's his attorneys who are filing specious motions to try to delay things. His, some would argue his plan was to put off all these criminal investigations until he could announce 
as a candidate so that he would have this very argument that you're making, which is now this is a political persecution. Nothing could be further from the truth in terms of at least what's happening in Georgia. The, the uh, district attorney, uh, Fannie Willis here in, in Atlanta, ha- has the goods on him. He called and threatened with criminal prosecution as a sitting president. He threatened a state election official to go find him votes so that Georgia would flip. If people aren't concerned about that, I would ask you to examine your priorities because that is where he's going to face the music. And his attorneys have been filing motion after motion, delaying the whole process. It took six months for the district attorney down here to get Lindsey Graham's testimony because there was a court fight over whether or not the Senate debate clause shielded Graham from testifying. So you want to talk about timing. The timing, at least here in Georgia, has been dictated by Trump and his minions. So think about that now when he gets indicted down here and everybody starts arguing about political prosecution, because this case would have been brought in Georgia six months to a year ago if it wasn't for Trump and his lawyers. Well, in that case, he's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's not, this, is how, this is how this always plays out. You know, away. He's, he's either a super genius or sometimes he's not that for, smart. You gotta wait for thirty years in Manhattan with all kinds of stuff that the statute probably still hasn't run on. Um you know, contractors allegedly, didn't get allegedly. paid. Allegedly. Right. And we want to take a look. You know, we could go back now to thirty years ago and take a look. At the valuations he placed on those buildings. Did that include the money that you were supposed to pay the contractors but never did? Right? I, I, you know, once you get into this business records exception, I, there was a time in New York City when Rudy Giuliani was running the Southern District when basically if your name did not end in a vowel, you could be as much of a mobster as you wanted. <laughs> if they were ending in a vowel, buddy, you're going to jail. Larry, Larry uh, he got elected. It's okay. It's okay. He was president. You just have to put that behind you and just realize. No, the it, harm to it, our it's, country. It's okay. The harm to our country can't what, be put behind us. What harm did he do to our country while he was president? Oh, he tried to overthrow. He didn't a, overthrow a, a, anything. He tried to overthrow the results of a free and fair election. And you're never, ever going to find somebody you can point at in this country who did such a nasty thing while president of the United States. Never. I think it's just so sad how the lawyers in the uh, conversation are, you know, taking words and, and mutilating their context. I mean, to say, find me votes is not saying, you know, that, that that's not a threat. That's that's a ridiculous notion. And you know that wouldn't hold up in court. Uh, uh, as, for, as for, you know, every... Every indictment that has came down, I think there's four right now, you know, none of them are going to stick. They're all frivolous. And the DA's office in uh, with Alvin Bragg in Manhattan is basically a, a criminal enterprise with these types of suits that they're trying to put against Trump. It's ridiculous. And every time we watch one fall apart, the grand jury, you know, suspends uh, the actual hearing. It's It just shows, you know, how ridiculous a lot of these charges are. But we're saying, nope, that next one, that next one's going to get it. Wh- it's which deranged. one of these? There were some impeachments that didn't go so well. But which one of the grand juries has... Uh, well, impeachments at, at, are political, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which of the grand juries has said no? But no York, true bill. New York City, Larry, no crime. Larry, New York City, they, they suspended their grand jury. Larry, the true way to make Trump not run again is just to elect him, right? Elect him, and then he's term limited out, and he will never run again, and we won't have this issue. Oh, so, no, he, so, he'll try to get the Constitution changed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's yeah. Not, I don't think that would do it, Mike. <laughs> he's going back to FDR. And, and I'm one of those people that was suffering from Trump fatigue. I'm ready for the next guy to come in. But, but these types of things, these are what inspire people to say, oh, my God, here we go again. Whether Whether – it's true or not whether these allegations are true or not it looks the the optics of it looks like somebody's going after trump again and and it will become nothing again and this is purely political again now i'm i'm not saying that joe you're wrong about anything you're saying 
I'm just saying the optics of it to the the average American are like, here we go again. Joe Ferretti, you were trying to say something earlier to Alonzo. Well, I, 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 I'm just surprised that he would poo-poo what happened here in Georgia. There, you can read the transcript of his call with Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State for Georgia, where he's talking about finding votes. Oh, yeah, sounds innocent enough. But he also starts mentioning criminal action against the Secretary of State. This is a sitting U.S. president. I, but that doesn't bother people. I, I can't help you. I, I don't know what to say. But the point here is, and Mike's right. Mike Heitz right. Because uh, uh, too many people rely just on the optics. Uh, you know, you, you don't go read the transcript. You don't understand what the pre- – because it's a 45-minute discussion. And it takes a little effort to read that. But if you read it, you're, you're aghast at a sitting U.S. president making that phone call. And, and I, I don't know where you draw the line, but at least here with these, which was the, the indictment is coming in Georgia. I don't know what I don't care what's happening in New York because yeah, it involves a porn star and, and, and whatever. But I, here, this is serious stuff. And I've always said that Georgia matter is going to be the most serious problem. Yes. And, and they're going to nail him for that because it, there's nothing he can deny. He had the phone call is in a transcript. Everybody can read it and understand it. He called to threaten a state election official to turn the votes around in a contested presidential election. And had Georgia flipped, had those guys not had the backbone they had, this this country would have been in a heck of a mess. Uh, so uh, and, and that would have been all Trump's doing. It took couple guys down here to draw the line and say no we're not going there thank god for them but you still have the issue of what was the president up to what was his intent what were his actions and are they criminal and and we'll find out soon enough but you mike's right you know the optics look terrible just because of the timing but everybody has to think about why the timing it is the way it is final word goes back to you larry then we move on to issue number five uh i think that uh um Donald Trump is uh, in deep trouble in Georgia. I think he's finally, for once in his life, in deep trouble in Manhattan, too. And both of those things are going to hurt him with sensible, conservative people in the Republican Party, and they'll find somebody else to vote for. I'm, I'm surprised Trump survived his Georgia behavior, and this has nothing to do with the phone call. He sabotaged the runoff election, which cost the Republicans the Senate. No one holds him responsible for it. Mike Kite, issue yeah, number five. You're right. So uh, over the past couple of decades, the Eastern Panhandle has grown like no other county and no other area in West Virginia. And because of that growth, we've gotten more delegate seats. We've gotten uh, leadership positions in both the House and the Senate. So my question is, will the Eastern Panhandle become a hot spot on the campaign trail for those statewide elections um, that really matter in the state of West Virginia. Alonzo Perry. Well, I think uh, there's definitely a lot of power concentrated in the Eastern Panhandle right now. I think that there's a lot of uh, potential candidates, and I think former candidates that you know are interested in running in the 2024 election. Um, I do think that there will be some primaries here and there, but I think it's going to be spotty, just like kind of the midterm election where there were some people that didn't even have a Democrat opponent. Um, I see some of the bigger seats maybe getting a challenge here or there. I could see, I could see some uh, someone running for Senate against Clark Blair. I could see somebody running, you know, for um, maybe a couple delegates have primaries, but all in all, I don't think that there's anything um, really developing with people wanting to get involved. Well, let me let me clarify a little bit because my question is: Will you see those those uh, those seats, like let's say the governor, the auditor, even uh, the the congressman, will they all come to the Eastern Panhandle um, to have debates and to be seen? And and because the Eastern Panhandle has become so populous that before you could ignore 
the Eastern Panhandle in a statewide re- election. I don't know that you can anymore. So are they starting to recognize that? The people from Charleston that are running in these races, are they starting to recognize that? And will we see them in the Eastern Panhandle? And Mike, thank you for self-editing before you mispronounced the election. The way you were going there had me worried there about what was going to be happening statewide. Go ahead, Mike Horman. So they would be complete idiots if they ignored the Eastern Panhandle. I think we're going to see a large, uh, you look at the governor's race, um, you know, Mr. Marcy hasn't put his name in yet, but uh, for the people that are running right now, if they ignore the Eastern Panhandle, they're crazy. They need to be up here. I, I know I've talked to uh, Caleb Hanna, who's uh, running for auditor. He will be spending a lot of time up here because he realizes the importance. Um, the, the the question for me is, you know, one, I, as a radio station, I don't know, I want lots of candidates, and they should definitely... And a much stronger Democratic yeah. <laughs> Party locally. <laughs> yeah, um, but... At the same time, I'd be interested to see what those other, because there's a lot of open seats statewide now. Everybody seems to be running for, for right. governor, and, and we've got who's nothing. Who's running for treasurer? Who's, who, right. All those others. And, you know, the Eastern Panel generally votes for somebody from the Eastern Panel, and when we don't, we pick a, a horse and we, we choose the winner. We, we're usually on the right side, so that will be mine. Two cents. I, Mr. Schultz? I believe it will only become a regular thing once – the panhandle regularly picks the winner in a primary. Okay, so once we start picking the winners, especially if that person has come up here and put some effort in, then the others uh, will learn, hey, I got to go there. Uh, I got to get my name. And that's how you build politicians coming to campaign in your area. You have the population, but usually there's a lag. And before they realize, holy cow, I got to get up there because my opponents aren't going up there or because my opponents are. I've got to start going up there. And that's how you do it. I think it will happen after there's some big surge and somebody wins a governor's primary or treasurer's primary or auditor's primary largely on the basis of a big win in the Eastern Panhandle. Then everybody will say, oh, okay. You know, I was looking at the numbers on paper, and it looked like that could happen. Now it's happening. I got to get up there. Can, can somebody from Charleston or Morgantown or you know Wheeling or whatever it is, uh, Huntington, can somebody win that vote in the Eastern Panhandle? I think so. Yeah. Um, it depends on, of course, who the Eastern Panhandle person is, yeah. but uh, or if there even is one. Yeah. Uh, but sure. Um, but don't you see? Well, let's get Joe in here before we run out of time. Then we'll circle back around, Joe. Well, I, I, look, I'll give the man his due. I'm not a big fan, but uh, Alex Mooney went over to the Northern Panhandle and spent some time, and he ended up beating McKinley on his home turf in all but one county over there. So, you know, it, it, having a personal appearance now and then in a certain locale works. Uh, but, you know, it's also incumbent upon uh, us in the Eastern Panhandle to hold these people accountable. If they don't show up, if they don't, do anything but run a bunch of ads and billboards and things like that, then don't vote for them. I mean, ho- let's hold them accountable. Let's make sure we make our distinctions in how we vote based upon who comes up here and sees us face to face. Once we establish that you need to be here, they'll eventually come. Mr. Height. So to, to Larry's point, don't you think that um, when somebody like Rowie Moore and, and uh, Morrissey and um, – even Mooney, who are all from the panhandle, are winning these major statewide elections. Don't you think that's enough of a indicator to the other people in the state that say, hey, you know, people from the panhandle are getting elected because their base is in the panhandle. If we can secure enough votes, if we can win the panhandle, it does a lot for us to win the entire state. I do think that's that's an impulse to push him that way. I don't think it's going to become a regular thing until they start winning. And that provides an opportunity for some of the very people you're just talking about in this next election. Yeah. Get in here, win this place big, and all of a sudden you own the state. You own the the only, and and th- this will be your last chance cuz next time there's going to be every rotary club and every uh, you know, panhandle organization of any size is going to have a dinner and all the candidates will be there. Sure. Well, panhandle had a reputation for the longest time of not turning out to vote. 
lower percentages here than around the uh, very true very key parts of the rest of the state. I don't know if that's still true or not, but that has been the reputation in the past. I think we've had great turnout recently. I think our our, our audience is much more informed. Uh, I think you can see that by the amendments, um, the way they 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 passed in the in the Eastern Panhandle, because obviously we have much more informed. Um, voters, in my opinion. Um, Did, especially those who listen to this especially show. Especially those that listen to, to our show, I think. Uh, the, the crazy thing is we're going to have a governor's race that, let's say, 20% of voters could, 20% could win that governor's race. That's hey, nuts. Yeah. Uh, get your final thoughts together. Everybody gets eight seconds. So, Larry, you can't tell your Abraham Lincoln story, <laughs> but it's a good one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a shame because it's a really good one.